Rivers are big and full of fresh water, which is great because we humans can only drink fresh water. But do you know what's their problem? Well, those rivers tend to lead to the ocean. And that means all that sweet, sweet fresh water vanishes into the salty, salty sea. This accident of circumstances is of course unacceptable. So, what if you can keep all that fresh water from leaking out there by damming the very sea itself? It might sound weird at first, but this is a real thing. A coastal reservoir. A freshwater lake created out of a piece of the ocean. In this video, I want to talk about the upsides and downsides of coastal reservoirs. But first, a sponsor read for the Asianometry newsletter. I know there's a lot of newsletters out there, but I try to give this one a lot of value. Full scripts and additional commentary after the fact. The sign up link is in the video description below. I try to put one out every week, maybe two. All right, back to the show. People have been damming off chunks of the coast for millennia. One primitive example of China's Zhejiang province dates back to the Tang Dynasty, where people dammed off a piece of the ocean with stones to create a freshwater pond. The modern coastal reservoir as we know it today first came in Zwaider Zee, Netherlands in 1932. This enclosed inland bay, called Ijsselmeer, covers 1,100 square kilometers or 420 square miles. Nice. Over time, however, the lake's water quality started to decline, as it received lower quality water from the Rhine River. Since then, its waters have turned more brackish. Another famous one is Plover Cove in Hong Kong, began in 1960 and completed in 1968. The Hong Kong government disconnected the cove from the sea with a two-kilometer dam, one of the world's biggest at the time, and then drained it entirely. The cove was then filled with rain and river water. Today, it serves as Hong Kong's biggest reservoir, storing about 230 million cubic meters of drinking water. In India, you have the Thanimon Bund. It was first constructed in 1974 to separate the Vembina Lake in the state of Kerala, India's longest lake. The goal was to impound the fresh water coming from four of India's big rivers. The project took several years to complete and did ensure a supply of fresh water from the normally brackish lake for irrigation purposes. But the Bund has also led to an epidemic of water hyacinths clogging the waters affecting the local fisheries industry. Another massive coastal reservoir I want to highlight is in Singapore, located right in their downtown business area. The $170 million marina barrage separated the entire marina bay from the ocean. Rain and river water then turned the bay into a massive freshwater lake over the span of a year and a half. It now provides for 10% of the country's water needs. I had previously done a video about this large reservoir, go check it out. The People's Republic of China has done a bunch of coastal reservoirs to provide freshwater supplies for their big urban populations. The Shanhu Sha Reservoir in Hangzhou stores fresh water from the Qiantang River for the city's emergency use. And then there is the massive $3.3 billion Qingchao Sha Reservoir in Shanghai, which literally means Green Grass River. Nearly 70 square kilometers large, it provides up to 50 to 70 percent of the area's raw, meaning before treatment, drinking water. When most people think about building a reservoir, they generally start by building a dam. And some of the world's biggest reservoirs sit behind large dams like the Three Gorges Dam, Aswan Dam, and the Hoover Dam. Such dams are engineering marvels, but the public opinion has largely turned against these massive traditional dams. The West has largely stopped building them in the 1990s for a variety of reasons. First, you need an ideal spot usually high mountains and deep valleys. A wide and shallow reservoir leads to higher than normal water evaporation loss. Many of the remaining sites are so remote that they are more used for hydropower generation than water collection. And unfortunately, many of these locations are also home to vibrant natural ecosystems. Building dams trap migratory fish, especially those who need free-flowing rivers for flood or breeding purposes. Forests become inundated, causing their trees to decay and release methane. And when people's homes get inundated, toxins and metals leach into the water, poisoning it. These rising waters are also socially disruptive. I did a video about the social disruption behind the construction of the Three Gorges Dam. People, many of whom have been living in their homes for many years, had to be evicted and moved. And speaking of safety, 
Big dams bring about safety concerns surrounding breaches and flooding. Such breaches are rare, but they are significant and can cause a great deal of life and property loss in downstream population centers. A big concrete dam costs a lot of money. The Three Gorges Dam took 20 years and $37 billion to build. At the time of its planning, its cost budget had been estimated at just $8 billion, so the dam really ran over. The Qingchao Sha was far less ambitious than the Three Gorges, but as a result it cost far less, with estimates being just $2.5 billion at the time. This paid for a 45-kilometer long dike, a water pipeline, and pumping stations slash gates. Concrete dams are largely one-off structures, and that's why they cost so much. That's not necessarily the case with coastal reservoirs. People are building more dikes around the world in response to coastal disasters and global climate change. I'm not sure whether or not that's a good thing. But anyway, as a result, there's been a lot of innovation in the space recently, especially using new materials like geotextiles, clay slurries, and prefabricated structures. Reservoir builders can leverage these innovations to cut cost. Furthermore, we should not only consider the cost of building these structures, which are massive as is, but the costs of maintenance as well. These maintenance costs can get deceptively high. For instance, there is silting. Soil erosion upstream leaves sediment that slowly fills up the reservoir, causing it to lose much of its capacity. So that silt has to be dredged out, which is expensive. When dredging is no longer effective, more expensive operations are needed. For instance, one recent desilting project for the Tengwen Reservoir in Taiwan cost $135 million and required digging a tunnel through a mountain. Coastal reservoirs have their own maintenance issues, which we can talk about later, but unless that river is exceptionally muddy, the progress of silting will be nowhere near as fast as they are with inland dams, which can be as high as 1% a year. And because I know people will ask, how do these costs compare to desalination and other systems? The unfortunate answer is that it depends on the desalination plant and the water. Singapore's Marina Barrage costs about $170 million and provides about 60 gigaliters of water, so about 283 million USD per 100 gigaliters. The Qingchao Sha cost about half of that. Desalination plants recently completed in Australia during the 2010s, Perth's Binning Up, Melbourne's Wantagi, and Adelaide's Port Stanvac, range from 1 to 1.7 billion USD per 100 gigaliters. Seems like a win for coastal reservoirs, but not so fast. Desalination is a variable beast. In 2012, the Texas Water Development Board estimated that desalinating brackish water at limited quantities could cost as little as $47.5 million per 100 gigaliters. So, it depends. The coastal reservoir's single biggest challenge is maintaining the water's quality. Several attempts at creating coastal reservoirs have failed due to the uncontrolled influx of salty or dirty water. Saltwater intrusion from the sea is a major problem. Strong tidal movement can cause salt water to leak through the reservoir dikes and enter the reservoir. Or marine groundwater, which tends to be quite salty, can bypass the dikes entirely. Floods can swell rivers and bring in a large amount of salt, fertilizers, microplastics, and other contaminants picked up from the rain. They dump into the coastal reservoir rather than the ocean. Then, over time, these accumulate to the point where the water becomes undrinkable. For instance, we have Lake Alexandrina in Australia. In the 1930s, the Australian government dammed the Murray-Darling River and the lake in an attempt to store its fresh water for its growing populace. Unfortunately, Alexandrina is broad and shallow. Eventually, evaporation left the lake's water too salty to be useful for drinking. In the 2000s, it was measured to be saltier than seawater. Other reservoirs have these issues. Qingcao Sha in Shanghai might be the pride of Chinese engineering, but its water also has elevated amounts of phosphorus, nitrogen, and chlorine. Its amounts are better than Shanghai's other sources, the Huangpu River and the Chenhang Reservoir, but it still needs treatment. And even after treatment, the water does not meet China's national standards for drinking water quality. There is no real answer here. One proposed on how to deal with this is to create flow lines, which allow us to close off the reservoir during heavy rains, or attach new systems that constantly purify the water and dump it back into the lake. 
or do what we do with inland dams and police them carefully for contaminants. Unfortunately, most of these reservoirs would be close to population centers, which makes it harder to keep their water clean. Estuaries where salt and freshwater meet tend to be extremely dynamic environments, and cutting them off from the ocean, of course, has consequences. Studies of the Singapore Marina Barrage found that the barrage had blocked off a few dozen species of fish who require saline waters for breeding. Declines in such fish populations can have negative effects on local fisheries. Damming off the river has the potential of creating stagnant water. Combined with the accumulation of chemical fertilizers, human sewage, industrial wastes, and pesticides coming in from river runoff, this can lead to massive algae blooms that kill off fish and poison the environment. The Qingchao Sha Reservoir has been experiencing more of these recently, despite implementing measures to avoid such stagnant waters. And Hong Kong's Plover Cove has historically suffered big algae blooms occurring at certain times of the year. In 2001, a particularly large one killed hundreds of fish. Cleanup crews had to remove the fish bodies and add new aeration systems to keep oxygen levels high. Coastal reservoirs make a lot of sense in areas that get large but uneven amounts of precipitation. Hong Kong is a great example of this. Most of its rain comes during a wet season, and for the rest of the year, the city is rather dry. Australia is another good case, despite their previous failure at Lake Alexandrina. There have been a lot of proposals for reservoirs in areas across Australia's various capital cities. Not aware of any that have gathered real momentum, though. India is a particularly good fit. The Indian Peninsula receives an average of about 1,172 millimeters of rainfall each year. Most of that falls on a short number of days, leading to monsoons and lots of water flowing out into the sea. One major coastal reservoir project now underway in India is the $12 billion Kalpazar project. It envisions building a 30-kilometer dam across the Gulf of Kambat to create the world's biggest freshwater lake. The lake would store up to 10 billion cubic meters of water from a variety of rivers for the Surashatra and central Gujarat regions of India. Right now, the project is still in the planning and environmental feasibility stages, so construction has not yet started. It will probably take another 12 to 15 years to complete. Should a country rely solely on coastal reservoirs? Of course not. Today's urban societies and their water systems are too big to rely on any single source, no matter how large. A coastal reservoir offers its own set of upsides and downsides for freshwater supply. It does not require as much investment to build and maintain, but at the same time is very much subject to contamination from both the rivers and the sea. However, the concept is a compelling solution for corralling all the freshwater runoff from the rivers and rain. It remains a vital part of the overall water portfolio. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.